right. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I am George Orchias, the Chief Technology Officer here at SITE. And today we have a special guest, Joe Slowick. Did I pronounce that right? You pronounced it perfectly fine for America. <laughs> Yeah, right. Um, uh, my, my name gets butchered all the time as well. So I always like to ask, uh, how are you doing today? Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. So I'm doing all right. I am currently a senior threat researcher at Domain Tools. Prior to that, I've been a principal adversary hunter at Dragos, focusing on, on industrial control systems, worked in the Department of Energy for Los Alamos National Lab, doing incident response work, and I'm an AV veteran doing cyber -y stuff from there. So right now, focusing mostly on APT, state-sponsored activity, but kind of doing a little bit of everything these days. That's awesome. No, yeah, I've seen your work on uh, domain tools on the blog. It's fantastic, and I want to dive a little bit into that. Um, can you tell me a little bit more of what do you actually do? Like what, what does threat hunting and really external threat hunting, right? Because you're, you're going after the bad guys out on the internet, not so much inside of an internal network, but what are the differences there and what, what does that entail? Sure. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why I went to the role that I'm in right now is that, you know, having a big pool of data is always the key thing for a threat hunter, whether that's talking internal. So you have, you know, host data, network data, so you can hunt in. Well, the same goes with an external perspective, uh, having the ability to go out and actually see what's going on in adversary space. And so what, what I do now primarily is try to leverage the data set that Domain Tools has access to, which is uh, domain registration, domain hosting, and similar sort of network data to try to really understand adversary hosting and infrastructure patterns and use that to identify, you know, not only analyze campaigns that have previously taken place, but then to use that knowledge to try to identify network infrastructure as it's spun up for continuing campaigns. And it's amazing, you know, I know there's a lot of people that say like, oh, GDPR and who is privacy? Like you can't do anything with domains anymore. It's like, ah, that's a lazy answer. Like That's just not true. That there's still a lot of things that you have to kind of check the box on in order to stand something up. And it's enough breadcrumbs that if you know what to look for, you can start spot spotting patterns and figure out who's doing what. Yeah, no, and that's something I definitely want to talk about because, you know, this video, it does go along with the blog post. And mm -hmm. the, the blog post I read was when you register a domain name, right? And I come from the red team perspective. I've uh, been doing that for about 10 years. I also have to register domains to then go mm -hmm. and uh, and use those in what we call zero knowledge engagement, right? Where the blue teams and a lot of the people in the target organization have no idea where we're coming from. So I read your posts and I see, you know, there's many different things about domain that do have things, even though it's not who is info. Can you dive a little bit into that? And then let's compare and contrast to what we do from the red team side. Sure. So to have a piece of network infrastructure, especially if you're associating it with a domain, you don't have to do, you can communicate directly to an IP address, but that has, you know, can be anomalous on its own. Exactly. Uh, but if you're creating a human readable domain to go along with things, you know, yeah, you need a who is record, but you, privacy services, whatnot. Although if you're lazy and you don't do things right, you could leak your part of authority email and some other things or whatever, which is always fun to see adversaries that mess that up. But even aside from that, you, know, you got to pick a place to register it from. So there's the registrar that you go through. Like, do you like GoDaddy? Do you like something really sketchy like Namecheap or uh, you know something else along those lines? Uh, it's got to have a name server of some sort that provides the authoritative record so that when people want to try to associate that to an IP address, like what's providing the authoritative answer? Well, that's a choice. It might be a choice that's defaulted by the registrar, or it might be something that set up yourself. But that becomes a touch point. Uh, hosting. And if it's going to be an active domain, like where is it sitting? You know, am I spinning up DigitalOcean or Linode instances and whatnot, which always looks kind of sketchy, or am I using some other hosting provider? And in that hosting provider, I can start diving in from there for like, okay, do I like spinning up Windows VMs? Do I like spinning up, you know, Ubuntu long-term support instances with uh, pretty default settings, uh, SSL TLS certificates if you're trying to do HTTPS or other communication. You know, certainly Let's Encrypt kind of muddies the waters on that these days, but if you're trying to spin up a number of things roughly simultaneously, you get people who get kind of lazy and use single cert in order to manage multiple infrastructure pieces. So you, really by looking at all of those components, you can start 
changing what I think a lot of the threat intelligence industry likes to dismiss as like, oh, domains, like that's just an atomic indicator. You can't do a whole lot with that it's like bottom of the pyramid of pain. If, if you want to look at it that way, it's like, no, like if you really start picking this apart, there's a lot more there if right. you have the time to analyze it and understand what you're looking for. Right. There, there's still behaviors of how an adversary goes through and does this. And, um, you know, now for the red team side, um, we do exactly the same thing, right? We find a register that where we can uh, purchase, but without attribution back to us. So when I was doing this at a Fortune 500, we actually paid uh, kind of like a retainer to a VAR, and then they would go and register the domain and set up the hosting and all that. So it wasn't pointing back to us, and they knew it was like the internal red team. But yeah, there was a registration information for the particular domain, right? That, of course, you, you can hide, as you mentioned. But then there's the hosting info. And one time we were doing an engagement, we were using Namecheap. And I don't know how what exactly was leaked. This was like four years ago. But the blue team found out that that was ours because we ended up using a particular uh, name before going with this VAR. Um, but then also the certificates. You mentioned purchasing certificates versus Let's Encrypt. And then creation time, right? I always say like yep. red team needs at least 30 days prep for attack infrastructure because if you, I buy a domain and a, a TLS certificate with, you know, three days anticipation, one, you're going to see that on the cert, but then you're also going to see that in reputation service or categorization services, right? Unless uh, it was purchased from a uh, uh, already categorized domain that expired. So when yep. you're doing this work, like how often do you find red team infrastructure versus actual adversary infrastructure? Fairly often, actually. I've gotten mm -hmm. some messages <laughs> um, uh, from like, hey, can, can you delete that tweet or can you uh, like remove that because this is part of something else, mm -hmm. which you, know, you kind of have to do a little bit of vetting on that. But, uh, mm -hmm. but yeah, I mean, it, it is interesting how you find some of the red team pen tester infrastructure creation start to overlap with legitimate bad actor infrastructure creation because a lot of the same techniques a lot of the same um, points of convenience whether that's in terms of registrars that don't ask too many questions or hosting providers that are really privacy oriented suit the needs of both entities uh, i know like going way back to a previous position when I was at Los Alamos and we had an internal red team that we, you know, you might say this kind of defeats the purpose, but to avoid the expense of burning red team infrastructure repeatedly because it costs money in order to spin some of this stuff up, especially if you're trying to make it look good, is that we got to the point in order to avoid that, that it's like, okay, let's give the blue team a heads up on the network infrastructure and then call everything after that, you know, black box or you know you're unaware of these sorts of things or at least let someone know so that we don't just start nuking infrastructure and running up the budget for the internal right. team which isn't the best answer but you know yeah, it it's, is a it's answer. where you weigh in the actual objective and the goal of the red team engagement right after yeah. you've measured the people and their response to it then you can move on and you know uh, i wrote one of the frameworks for the regulatory use of uh, pen testing or threat led pen testing and we had this uh, de-chaining example of, okay, cool, you did a good job finding our domain. Maybe you even identified the C2. Let's, you know, white card that. Let's say, okay, now don't bring that down anymore. Let's focus on the other TTPs because, you know, that command and control tactic and initial access is only one of many tactics in Minder Attack that you might want to uh, test that as well. But um, going back to the hosting, how often yep. do you see adversaries using things like AWS or Azure or Google Cloud being like the three legit ones that no organization blocks uh, versus using, you know, the more shady ones? I'd say it's almost an even split right now as there are risks, uh, you know, the AWS, Azure, Google Cloud have, you know, they're reputable for a reason. If you let them know that some shady is going down on their infrastructure, they're more likely and things like impound a VM and other things or whatever that can aid analysis. So it's a risk, even though it is more likely to evade uh, initial detection and initial sp suspicion hosting something in like Hostsailor or Hetzner or you know pick some other provider that just immediately screams like 
probably bad. Uh, but the other side of that is that with these providers, like there's less likelihood that if you, when, when and if you do get caught, that that will result in follow on steps by that provider or even a, an abuse takedown by that provider uh, because they're either not amenable to that or they just don't have the resources to follow it up pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, really it just kind of like depends. I've seen both and I don't see it trending really strongly more towards the other. It is interesting though, I see more uh, red team activity use things like a AWS than threat actor activity. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just a combination of familiarity and uh, you know, ease of use in terms right. of you know purchasing something instead of from some shady VPS provider located in Bulgaria or something like that. Right. And on the other hand, you probably see less red team infrastructure in the shady ones uh, yeah. compared to the adversary. Right? Yeah, and that's, I mean, that, that's also, I think, goes down to operational security, right? Um, yep. you're, you're going to, you've been sanctioned and allowed to go into a particular enterprise. Like, you generally want to do that from a trusted provider, if you will, um, mm -hmm. versus a shady one. So um, I, I think that's an interesting point. And then on the, um, you know, just wrapping up the operational security side as well. Um, one of the things that we teach and I teach for my SANS Red Team Exercise and Adversary Emulation course is things like setting up access control lists at a very minimum where no one can access at least the infrastructure side, right? The administrative part, your SSH or RDP or whatever you do to admin it, but also setting access control lists for the proxies of your target organization to be able to control and then everyone else either redirect them somewhere else or don't, don't let them connect at all. Do you see adversaries doing that uh, quite a bit or are adversaries kind of jumping through and not really doing much OPSEC on, on all their infra? So I think it depends on the adversary and depends on the campaign. Uh, there's certainly some things that get spun up pretty quickly, especially if you start talking about things that are used not for CT2 purposes necessarily, but for things like credential capture and spoofed login portals, that those are pretty primitive, generally speaking. Uh, whereas for C2 portals and, and whatnot, uh, I'm more familiar with, you know, even if it's something as simple as a geographic uh, limitation or a user agent limitation in order to try to limit who can access those resources. It's actually interesting, I uh, have a, another blog post coming out tomorrow that uh, deals with a campaign where an adversary was doing that sort of gating with some network infrastructure related to the World Health Organization that if you were trying to just hit it from the, the internet, it would return just a redirect to a legitimate resource. But if you hit the domain with a certain URI path and a certain user agent, it ends up turning returning the second stage of malware. And you know, so we see adversaries that understand whether that's from an operational security perspective or just from a pure anti-analysis uh, perspective that know how to leverage this because it's not that hard in order to put these sorts of controls in place. I think it really just depends on how focused your targeting is. Like if I know that I'm only going after a certain subset of organizations or only those instances where my malware has been deployed and I want it to be deployed as opposed to campaigns that might be a little bit more widespread like wide ranging ransomware campaigns or something like that. Nice. Um, the, the last question here is uh, I did a talk. I was talking with uh, Dave Maynard from Lumens. I, I saw you did some, some work with those folks uh, recently uh, in, yep. in, in another blog post. That's awesome. Where uh, he has some red team experience, lots of red team experience, actually more than I do. But um, he's like, hey, you know, um, I've actually been using some red team techniques and, and tradecraft as I have acquired infrastructure to do my external threat hunting. Is that something that um, you also do and you're, you're engaged with is going out and like signing up for some of these not so good looking uh, hosting providers and, and kind of do the hunting from there for attribution purposes or lack of attribution purposes? Yeah, and you know, not to get into too much detail here because I don't want to let everyone know what's going on. Correct. But, you know, I would I would say that at a minimum, if you really want to get engaged in that sort of external space threat hunting, at the very minimum, you need to set up a network of proxies and deniable services, if nothing else, for routing traffic, so that you don't start doing things like broadcasting your, you know. Nowadays, in a work from home perspective, like, hey, this is my house. This is my IP address. Uh, just let you all know as I'm scanning all your crap and W getting all your open directories and whatnot. So having, you know, at least a couple of exit points. And then if you really want to start getting sophisticated, having exit points that are related to specific geographic threat nexus or to certain areas of interest 
in order to try to map out like, okay, if I think that, you know, I'm operating with an adversary, not even just to get around something like a geographic block, but to make sure that if I have an adversary that's targeting things in India or South Korea, and all of a sudden they see someone from the United States doing a bunch of requests to the infrastructure, it's like, oh crap, that's probably a researcher, burn everything down. It's like, eh, let's try and blend in a little bit more. So that I think is a minimum. If after that, you could really start getting into down some rabbit holes, like, you know, whether you're setting up complete personas to do things like forum browsing uh, and, you know, trying to stand up things like more of a honeypot sort of infrastructure in order to try to attract attackers to you. So it really just depends on, you know, how much work you're willing to invest what sort of adversaries are going after? Again, the bigger game uh, in, in out in the world or whatever is going to require a bit more effort. And what resources you have available to you? Because I would even say for a, a number of researchers, if you're really just going after a lot of garden variety crimeware threats and even some of the less savvy state-sponsored adversaries, just buy NordVPN and switch up your exit nodes to where things are going through is better than nothing. Uh, or, you know, pick another VPN provider. Uh, don't use it for your own stuff, obviously, but if you're trying to redirect uh, your connection through something, it's like, yeah, it's reasonably inexpensive and it's better than just, you know, coming out of your home network every time you're trying to pull something. Yeah, and OPSEC is definitely important. And, you know, I try to push that as well. Like when, when I have new red teamers coming in, tell them the importance of it because you end up using it for a whole bunch of other things, as you just mentioned. It's, um, and, and obviously what you're doing is a little more dangerous than, than the red team OPSEC, but uh, red team should also follow up <laughs> operational security. Um, awesome. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Where can folks find you or hear more about what you're working on? Sure. So uh, my Twitter feed is very active. So at JF Slowick uh, will find me. I can be reached via email at jslowick at domaintools.com. If you want to get into some spicier things, you can check out the personal blog at pylos.co, pylos.co. And otherwise, check the Domain Tools blog as you know, I've only been there for about a month now, but I'm aiming to have a pretty rapid uh, schedule here of putting out content. So hope yeah, to keep no, that up in the future. Yeah, no, I'm loving them. I didn't even know you had only been there a month, given all the posts you had already done. I <laughs> was going through a number of these, just you know, coming up with uh, with questions and you know, comparing and contrasting with red teaming uh, and attack infrastructure. So again, appreciate your time, appreciate your blogging, and and you know, all, all these awesome resources you're giving to a community uh, on behalf of the community. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, thank you. Always a pleasure talking to people from Scythe. Awesome. Cool. See, pretty, pretty easy. Nice and easy, yeah. Yeah.